Cool. Yeah. Welcome, everyone, to the second debate, to the second one to everyone. Uh, now with Matthias Meisberger from Strategizer, the jack of all trades there, and uh, also Strategizer co-founder Alan Smith, who will be joining us as soon as he has figured out uh, his audio issues. Um, and they will be debating with Pat Keenan, uh, who I think goes quite a way back with Alan and uh, is a designer in Toronto. So yeah, without further ado, I would hand it over to Matthias uh, to kick us off. And uh, yeah, you have seven minutes. I will uh, keep time for you and uh, looking forward to your pitch. Um, start presenting. Great. So um this was uh yeah inspired because i was thinking a lot about um product management lately and um also asked myself the question like why is there a product manager and i was uh, i was thinking like what does a product manager actually do like they do they're like domain experts they're designers they're researchers they're visionaries they're strategizers um there are politicians and there are so much more. Like there's so many things that, that a product manager does. And when, when we think about the business, uh, a product manager is like, why do you install that product manager? Because he's that single point of contact for you if you have questions around the product. Well, and he's the owner of something. So uh, you, can, you can hold him accountable or her accountable um, for the work that the product team is doing. So that's really great from a business perspective because it's just the single point of uh, contact. And what's actually actually the job of a, of a product manager? Um, actually pretty simple. It's delivering, uh, creating value for customers, right? Um, but have you asked yourself like how much do they actually contribute to creating value for customers? And how much of the time of their available time do they actually use to create value for value for customers? Because is that really the case? So do they do that or is, do they actually do something else? So if you think about like, I've seen a lot of product managers in, in my career, I'm 20 years in now I'm in, in big corporates and small companies. And a lot of them would have said probably something like, um, I have a team and I'm kind of managing to keep away the noise from them. Um, I need to gather information, like how far are we with, with the product? And we need to, uh, I want to communicate that to the C-level or to my boss. And I need to attend a lot of meetings that you don't have to attend. Um, so you can spend time coding, you can spend time uh, doing what you can do best. So, what that usually does with with such a team is what i found is um they silo get they get siloed so they get like put into this box and you have this small interface called product manager who basically decides what information come in and what goes out and then trying to manage the yeah the um people in there like in a small cage so ever seen a lion uh, in, in, in the zoo, uh, running in circles. So it, some product organizations have been a bit like that. So what does it make with the product manager? The product manager has to invest a lot of time in managing people, stakeholders, processes, and all of that stuff. So, and if you ask, does this create value for customers? Probably not directly. Um, and because so many people keep pulling on that product manager, there is the engineer saying, hey, I need this. Then there is a CEO coming and saying, oh no, I want these numbers. Can you, can you tell me when this is finished? I have a new feature for you that you have to develop. So I don't know how many people know this situation. Maybe you just put it in the chat. I'm really curious about that. Um, but this makes this person really stressed. Like think about it. I don't know if you work for a product manager, if you're a product manager yourself, are you stressed by all these 
management things that have literally nothing to do with your product. So if we now think, okay, that's a person, but actually the person is filling a lot of, wearing a different hat, sorry, like that, uh, wearing a lot of different hats. But these uh, these hats come with like jobs. So they, they have, they're concentrating on different jobs to be done. So what do you have to do as a product manager? And if we extract that from that role product manager, then we see that this is actually things that can be done by different people, maybe even different people at different times. So being able to circulate product management between people in a team while not calling the person product manager, but one is good at like communicating with stakeholders for that particular feature or for that part of the product right now, then why not do it? Because then you, you just save all these like uh, silent uh, male things that happen between like the, the bottleneck of a product manager. Information you might find interesting don't get through to you if you, uh, if you always go through that bottleneck. Ultimately, that product manager becomes this one. Uh, I think it's called a scapegoat. So it's, everyone is just like punching the product manager for, uh, for going forward. And this doesn't work. Like this, this keeps the product manager away from everything that is related to the product and creating customer value. And that's for me, like, it's really not cool to have that in, in an organization because the customer is the, the one that is the most important for your organization or for your product. And distributing out those um, jobs that a product ma manager does or a traditional product manager does to other people, um, I think is a solution of really empowered teams. So the gist of this is serving the needs of the business is not something that a product manager should do or a product organization, but serving or creating value for customers. This is what we want to do. And yeah, that's about it. This is what should happen with product and I'm done six minutes. Nice. Cool. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, Alan, not sure. Uh, First of all, great that you're here. Uh, is there something you wanna wanna add to that? I'd love to add that you know we've as strategizers, I'll speak from specific experience and get away from uh, you know abstract. We've gone from you know sort of founder-led product management to a dedicated like professional pro product manager to team um, sort of chipping in with a sort of half project uh, product manager role. And we've never moved faster than when we had the sort of little bit of the blend, but mainly everyone contributing and solving problems uh, in different ways, more along the lines of what Matthias has said. So just speaking from specific experience um, over the last few years of developing product, product here at Strategizer, we've seen one of them work. So I can say that. Nice. Cool, thank you. Then uh, I would say let's hand it over to Pat. Uh, give sure. him the same seven minutes and let's go. Great, so yeah, um, I'm Pat. I, uh, I am a designer. I've uh, previously been at Google and Facebook, I'm currently in Toronto now. I'll be kind of representing from uh, Secret City Adventures, which is sort of a skate game company. And then I started with my wife. And um, so I have a varied experience with product managers. And I think the one theme, like I just have my little notes here scrolled down, but the one theme that I've found about great product managers is they do what I don't want to do. And I think that's fabulous. So I think that, you know, I've dabbled in, um, I've dabbled in, you know, engineering, putting together websites, I've dabbled in design uh, and, uh, in all of those cases, I'm just kind of horrible about closing things up. And I need a partner who's going to take what I'm working on and hold me to account. And I think that's really what product managers do. And it's kind of like the responsible part of the team. Uh, so 
you know, I wrote it down a couple of things like what is management, you know, you have time management, which is your managing delivery. And I think probably at a consulting company or an agency, you're more worried about client deadlines um, than specifically results because you can't necessarily track them. I think at a larger company, you're worried about people management. So, you know, are, is my team getting along? Do they feel like they're, they're vibing? Um, yeah, are they growing, uh, getting promoted? And then I think at, uh, in the more of the product sphere, you're like looking at results. So what is, uh, you know, it might be what's our bottom line. It might be like, what's our net promoter score. Uh, it might be, um, how quickly are we launching? But like, what are the, what are the results of the product? Actually, that's probably not a results based one. I guess what customers are saying, are they buying more of our stuff? Um, so you have sort of results management. Uh, and then another definition I found was controlling things or people, which I think is just like the most awesome definition for a job, um, controlling things or people. Uh, uh, I, from what I've seen, that's definitely not what product managers do. If anything, they have all of the responsibility and none of the control. And so the best product managers I've worked with are actually really good influencers really good at understanding where the org needs to go, <clears throat> sitting in on the research and um, finding ways to move things forward for the next ship date, maybe two weeks from now, maybe a month from now, uh, managing that short term and then also getting people excited about uh, the longer term. Um, let me see here. Yeah, and I, I guess also it's important to anchor this conversation in historically, where did product managers come from? And like, where did even designer come from? Like, I just think back to like Park Xerox or like, you know, the labs, Bell Labs, and um, they were all engineers. Like the people designing the mouse or like the graphic user interface were just all called engineers. And there was no product managers per se. They certainly had managers they had to report to, but they were like in a bit of an enclave and everybody was a bit of a generalist. Um, Notably, they created like some of the most influential technology that would last decades. Also notably, they failed. So they totally didn't work as businesses. And so I think it's interesting to think about, you know, if you have all these multiple hats, everybody's different wearing different hats, who's responsible for the stuff that nobody wants to do? And I think in my experience, that's the product manager. They have sort of this absurd motivation where they're just really excited about getting stuff done. You know, I think I put a personality lens on this, uh, which is, um, you know, I think about the Enneagram, which is just sort of like a different personality test. And some people are just like achievers. They just really like achieving. Some people are helpers. They really like helping other people. Some people are learners. Some people are individualists. Some people are leaders. Uh, I know for myself, I'm a learner, which means that I love just getting halfway through a project having a general idea of how this thing would end and then just not, you know, just kind of moving on to the next thing. And uh, obviously that does not make for great products. Uh, and I think that's where uh, the product manager kicks in to help us uh, who are less focused on, on that end result. And I think I can kind of play both hats. Um, and I can empathize with that, that need. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that there's, there's definitely a role for, for that, personality type, whether that job definition in 10 years from now is called a product manager, whether we move in a more generalist direction or a more specified direction. I think if history tells us anything, we'll probably get more specific. Uh, even now there's like interaction design, motion design, um, you know, production design, um, information architecture. So I imagine we'll get more specified, but this is something that we can debate. But I do think that there will always be a role for people who are willing to jump in and do what other people don't want to do. Awesome. Thank you, Pat. Cool. Well, uh, then let's get right into our debate. I think there's uh, actually plenty to debate about. Um, maybe starting with uh, Matthias, what you said uh, as kind of this, this place where actually product managers shouldn't uh, ideally be 
um, you know, being the interface uh, for a team silo, protecting uh, the team, like do, doing that. Uh, and now hearing Patrick talk about, you know, him, him as someone on that team, really wanting the PM to be the person who does all the stuff that uh, he, he doesn't want to do. Um, is then, isn't then a bit the idea of distributing those uh, PM tasks out more? Isn't that then al almost like picking the easy parts of product uh, management and uh, pushing the, the hard ones to the team? There's a question. What is the easy part of a project product manager? What's, uh, what's the stuff you don't wanna do? Uh, I think it's different to many people. Like some people like doing alignment things like talking to stakeholders. Other people love talking to customers and they, they just thrive in that. Other people don't want, don't want to talk at all to customers. So it's, um, is that the nature of, of that product manager? Does it have like, then you're looking at a very small group probably who can master all of that. Um, the things I don't want to do, I'm like, Honestly, you think everyone has things he doesn't want to do. And um, so I'm, I'm always glad if someone does that for me. Like, I don't like changing the diapers. I don't like it. And I have to do it <laughs> <laughs> because my wife is not always uh, taking that on. Well, uh, let's, let's not add changing diapers to the PM. Well, talk. that's an excellent question. I would say if a designer and a PM were married, who would be changing the diapers? Do, do we have a couple like that in the, in the, uh, in the chat? Oh, okay, uh, Alexandra, you know what? Um, why not? Uh, seeing that someone already raises their hand to say something here. And I just realized that actually my wife's a product manager. I was originally a designer. We don't have kids though yet. So uh, we will have to Can wait a little bit back. Can we conversation, please? You hear me? Uh, now we hear you. Yeah, I just wish we didn't throw our time with the stupid example of diaper change because it's so, you know, in the sexist kind of thing. But the discussion was interesting when you were talking about the different roles and the maturity of the workforce of doing work that they actually don't like, but is completely necessary for them to give a better product. So it's not about doing the jobs that we don't like but rather interchanging roles that um, uh, to, to, to learn the perspectives. I mean, rotating the roles allows you to learn more about the different perspectives of the products. So if you learn more about the, the, the problems that a support person has or a product manager has, maybe you become a better programmer, you know? So it's about learning your own business too. It's not just, saying, okay, that's their area. We'll never be in that area. Or I never do it. I never challenge myself to do that area. But how else would you grow? Yeah, I definitely. That. I definitely agree. And I mean, just, just to speak to um, the things you don't want to do, I am being a bit facetious. So there's p part of that is just to prompt a uh, discussion. But I also do think that um, people have different tendencies. And, uh, you know, there are, there's a organizational theory that says really you should focus on your weaknesses um, and kind of like round yourself out as a generalist there's another school of thought that says you should really focus on your strengths and get other people to fill your gaps i think you know from what i understand focusing on your strengths is is the better one to do partly because of division of labor but also just quality of life like i find that i just love learning i love learning and i and i really don't like being in meetings and out of that, that simple equation comes, you know, a subset of jobs. Um, and I'll talk to friends who love being in meetings all day and really don't want to get into the, like the details of Figma and like how, what the border radius should be. And so I, I do think that there's, it may not be natural and maybe learned, but there's a tendency that people have. And um, I think, you know, what you're pointing at is how might you expand your empathy or notion of other roles and the stuff that they're struggling with um, while still leaning into your capabilities. And, and so like in terms of PM, um, they have to naturally do that because a PM naturally is in the middle of things. 
but then as engineers or designers or other contributors, how, how might we develop that and empathy, I think is a, is a great question. But, um, I have a question. A lot of the talk is about PM, but how does the UX uh, designer in your world fit in there? Because in, I come from Norway, there's two discrepancies between the definition of a UX designer. A lot of people think it's a visual designer, it has nothing to do with it. It has to do with uh, gathering information and testing your hypothesis about what the users need, uh, which is more the academic university take on what a UX designer is. So which one are you operating in? Because there's, when I meet business uh, and I compare it to the school, um, it's quite different um, definitions of UX and how they organize. And if they're a waterfall and use a hammer for every time they have a project, they always use the same technology. Or if they build something from scratch and they have a lean sprint and, and or a product as a service. And if they have like a sandbox or not. All these are complexities in, in, in what a project manager does and what a UX does. You define it. What's your experience in that? Was that a complicated question? Yeah, I didn't do a good job at the question. I mean, I, I think it's a valid question. I think, you know, the, the, the context for this conversation was it set up a uh, debate about PM, but I'll let Matthias uh, sort of speak to, to the framing or Al. In, in our organization, we've used, uh, we've used the, the UX as somebody who's solving problems that aren't really visual and UI as problems that are more visual and more sort of almost like at the more surface tactical layer. That's generally how I see it um, between the gap between UX and UI. Um, getting back to, you know, let's, I, I think what you're scratching at there, Alexandra, is there's a bunch of things, somebody who's solving U UX problems, at least the way I've defined it, um, does that are kind of overlapping with what a product manager does to an extent in terms of doing research and understanding you know, what the user's real problem is to make sure that we're even solving the right problem. Now, when I just describe that task, is that a product manager task or is that a UX task? And who's gonna take that on in the organization, right? That's the problem of, do we need a PM or not? And like Matthias was saying earlier on, it's really about that division of things that we know that lead to great products. We know you need to do this. This, this needs to happen. If we don't validate and really understand customer problems, we're not going to be able to create value for customers, right? If nobody does that, we're not going to be able to create a great product without a ton of luck. Um, speaking to, you know, the, there's a concept that Pat was getting at in, in, other areas of leadership outside of product design, which is the idea of a visionary and an integrator. Um, and the idea is essentially teams need, uh, essentially, a, you know, a, a upper leadership level. There's usually a visionary who kind of has a sense of where everything's going. And there's, uh, an integrator who knows actually how to get it there. Right. And that these are different profiles, like Pat was speaking yeah. to. And I really believe in that. And the sort of third concept that, you know, Pat mentioned about the idea of the, the Enneagram and different profile types. Um, there's another concept I'd love to introduce this group to. If you don't know it, it's called the unique ability concept. Um, unique ability is the idea that there's four things on your to-do list, uh, no matter how your team is organized. And you can think about, you know, what's on your list now. There's things that you're doing that you're terrible at and you get below average results and you hate doing. There's things that you get average results at but you really hate doing. There's things you're really good at, but you don't love doing and you get above average results. So people keep giving that to you. And then there's the things that you get above average results doing and you love doing the most. So if you look at your to-do list and you kind of split it up into those four buckets, almost like a ladder that goes from, you know, you don't like doing this and um, you don't do very well at it. Which one does it make sense to have more of on your to-do list, right? It's the, the top one. It's the stuff you love doing that you're actually really good at. And so in every unique team organization, you want to make sure that people are using their unique ability as much as possible. So when Pat says he does want to do this kind of thing, it's usually best that he has as few of those things as possible. So it's not about doing nothing you don't want to do. It's trying to take off, you know, as many things from the bottom of the list as possible kind of slowly and find the right organization with the group that you have. That's, that's one, one thought. 
All right. Uh, there are actually a few people waiting in the in the queue now, so I'm gonna add Benjamin first here, and then uh, afterwards uh, Janina. Cool. But uh, thank you for for that discussion. I think that's a really really cool model to, yeah. Uh, regardless of titles, figure out uh, how to to distribute work within a team. All right, Ben, you're up. Oh, thanks. Uh, first, my name is Ben, and I'm actually a product manager, but thank you guys for having this. Uh, appreciate the insights. Uh, I, I will say that I, I, I have a lot uh, in common with, with what Matt said about making sure the customer gets the value. Um, I think that's the key for the product manager is, you know, to be in contact with the customer. Um, in my organization, I have a delivery team. I don't pretend to know how to design. I don't pretend to know the best way to deliver it. I lean on that team to tell me what it should look like or what's the best way to deliver something. Of course, the ultimate decision is how well our customers utilize it. So uh, I, I think that the number one challenge product managers face is that, is that they get like those arrows coming at them from every direction and they start to think, well, I know how to do it all. Um, in reality, I don't know how to do it all. And I want, you know, that delivery team to make sure that they're, we're delivering it the best way. I'm never going to tell those guys what the best tech stack is for the product, you know, just like they won't tell me how, what the customers uh, want from our product. So I think there's, there's definitely a, a separation there. You know, our organization has done a great job of giving me a good team that supports me and I don't have to manage their day-to-day -day activities. Um, and, it, and it's all about me being out there, understanding what our customers need. I, the only disagreement I would have is I do think that there's a little bit of a responsibility to provide value back to the business in the sense that if I'm delivering a, a product that requires, you know, $100 million of support every year because I can't get, because I'm only thinking about the customers in mind, then that's costing the business money. So there are elements where you have to consider, you know, are you delivering a good product for the customers? That's number one. But is it is it supportable, sustainable, and and obviously, um, is it is it uh, going to provide you know a profit? Because that's that's the the object of the business. So, I, I just wanted to give my two cents on it. But I appreciate the feedback you guys are giving. It's great. Hey ben, I'm sure you're uh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, and I, I have a question. Like one, like one, yeah, yeah, you go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the the delay, right? It's the worst. Um, yeah. So yeah. Ben, one of the core arguments against you know having a PM that that often comes up and that you know we've debated with internally is the idea that uh, broken telephone, right? So you know you're listening to the customer, you're figuring out what they need, and then you're sort of like explaining that problem, you know, again to you know the designer or then uh, the designers that depending on how the organization is structured, designing the feature, and then the developers are developing it, right? And so there's sort of this like disconnect from, you know, photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy when it comes to the true understanding of what uh, the, the problem is you're trying to solve. Let's leave the business side out of it for now. Let's just focus on this area, which is, you know, problem solving, creating value for customers. How do you and your organization make sure that that doesn't happen? If we're sort of saying that's one of the real issues, the, the closer, uh, you know, if someone is to the customer and understanding their problem, the thesis is that they're going to do a better job of solving the problem. So how do you create closeness in your organization and avoid the, the uh, broken telephone? Yeah, so I, mean, I, have, the, I have the unique uh, place where I actually uh, did work on our implementation side and I, and I helped with development and I, I've been through that process in our organization. So um, I, I have a good understanding of, of what they do, um, but now I'm in a position where when I work with the customers day to day, I, I'm trying to interact with them more. Um, we use a great ideas portal uh, with AHA. We uh, engage with them you know, as much as possible. We have user conferences. So getting what the customer's needs are is the easy part. And that broken telephone usually comes when you're trying to relay that over to the design team, right? And that and that's understandable. Um, but I'm I'm close with those guys. I've been, you know, meet with them on a weekly basis, uh, two or three times a week sometimes, and we talk about individual ideas, you know, very freely. I don't I don't tell them here's what we're gonna do. I I tell them here's what I need. Here's what I think it should look like. 
what do you think? What are your ideas and how could we deliver it? It's, it's, a, it's maintaining that open communication. And I'll, I'll tell you in my experiences with other product managers, um, feeling like back to the feeling like you know it all, you, you really have to lean on people with the expertise. Um, you know, I, I can't stress that enough. If you have a design team, utilize their experience, utilize their, their subject matter expert. You know, I'm a subject matter expert in what our customers need and in the processes that we're solu that our solutions provide. But I, I'm not going to pretend to know the best way. So it's it's main, you really have to work at maintaining that dialogue and you know setting up those meetings and calling them and talking to them. Um, and and we've built a very good rapport. So you know it builds trust with each other so that we have respect for each other's position. Um, and ultimately, it, it smooths out that development process to where, you know, they go away, they build it, and they, they don't have to rework because they already know that, you know, because of that engagement, you're going to like what they're delivering. Um, if, you, if you go back to the old waterfall method, it's like you deliver it and then it's like, well, crap, that sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So uh, in an agile method, you want to keep that engagement and keep talking. I mean, you have to. Yeah, I think that actually uh, what you just said goes really well with what uh, Patrick mentioned earlier that uh, in his view, the best PMs are great influencers and thereby also great uh, communicators uh, above above all else. Uh, so we actually do have a couple of people in the queue here. So uh, what I'm going to do you guys. Is, uh, hey, uh, is just add all of you. Um, at once, uh, and Janina was the longest, so uh, why don't we give her the first uh, comment slash question here. Okay. Oh, hey, it's the two of you again, awesome. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, great. So um, I have a question for you that um, goes into the direction of the differentiation between product manager and product owner, and I will also give you a, an example. Um, in my organization, I'm responsible for a lot of things. So I'm the one who talks to the customer. So I'm the one who gets to know what, what are the needs of our customers, which features do they want. Um, then I'm also responsible to decide which features do we build and when do we build it. I create a product roadmap. But um, it's also my job to really break down the future, how shall it look, shall it look like, what's the target state, what is the user story, what are the acceptance criteria. Um, I also talk to the engineers and explain everything to build I plan the sprints. Um, I'm also responsible for um, quality management, everything that's deployed um, directly in time and quality. And I'm also the one who tells the, uh, our customers, hooray, we have a new feature, isn't it amazing? So. Um, um, also regarding all pro project management tasks and basically I would say my main job is to keep everybody on the same page and involved and in, on online. So my first question for you is what would just, you call sorry, this, this, Just so you, we know your role, does anybody else work at your company? <laughs> yes. You're doing everything. We yeah, adopt uh, many more people. <laughs> so that's a very good question. I think that's basically fine. So my question would be, so um, my first question is, it's always pretty hard to say, so uh, Janine, what are you working? I don't know. Maybe I'm a product manager. Maybe I am a customer success manager. I don't really have an answer. Um, so um, but the question is otherwise from that is, what do we need? So we need a product manager and I actually, so it's kind of hard for me to differentiate what are really the task of a product manager. So is it just the organization part or is it also the um, content part? And I'm, I just did not get it uh, right here. So maybe you can answer that. And um, because we had also in the chat a lot of questions. So what's the differentiation product manager, product owner? What do we need, um, or do we actually only just also need just one person who gets everybody on the same page, and does not really matter how we call it, but we need this person. So, what are your opinions on that? Uh, maybe I can add a comment here. Um, uh, also referring to what Alan had said, the broken telephone. Uh, I think that when it's a product manager or a product owner, 
we are the messengers between the customer to the team to the business and uh, as ben said that there is a lot of user shadowing and ux research can happen on one side where you gather the requirements and then it's the role of the pms or the pos to convert that into a representable manner and an easy manner that the management understands what they were talking about and uh, to let's say decomplexify uh, so that everyone else can understand and i think that's why this token telephone slash messenger comes in where uh, we connect basically and hold together everyone uh, uh, in the business basically mm. Yes, so basically it's the most communicative role that's necessary. Oh, sorry, Matthias, you wanted to say something. Oh, good. Um, like I, I just see, I, I heard a lot of responsibilities and it's, it, it, to me, it feels really stressful. So is your role stressful? Would you say that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. Okay. So do you do a lot of things that you don't like to do? It's, uh, <laughs> For me, it, it really sounds like they, when you read like Marty Kagan's book, Inspired, or something like that, um, where the mix of product managers and project managers is, is like a toxic thing. Um, so it, it seems like you're, you're owning a lot of stuff that maybe draws you away from really like having like free time in your head to think about the customer. Mm -hmm. If you're just on a rush all the time and and stressed about like, oh shit, process, oh damn it, I have to communicate that to the CEO and, and so on. So how can you really create value for customers if you're dealing with that all the time? Um, so that's like, if you're working in product, mm -hmm. go at the product, not at managing people. Uh, so you can't think of product strategy, vision and so on, that's, that's necessary. But I think keep focused on the product, try to get like, mm -hmm. push away the things that, that keep you from, from working on the product and creating value. Okay. Almost be that the be product that. manager position is more easily defined by what is not part of the job than what is part of the job. Mm -hmm. At least that's, that's what some of the discussion here uh, almost sounds a bit. It uh, might well be the case, yeah. With uh, so many uh, uh, responsibilities uh, coming on, it might well be the case that we can eliminate, uh, use the elimination uh, method to determine what uh, is the role. Yeah, I think there's an element there of just you have all of the responsibility, responsibility. and none and of the not ability. And like just through influencing people and like getting people on the same page, telling the story over and over again, I think it's huge. And I guess, uh, Ben, to your story, like I think what I found to be really helpful in a PM is humility and really just admitting I'm, you know, this is, you, you know, you, that's your realm. That's your realm. This is what I'm hearing from the customer. Not like you should do this, but this is what I'm hearing from mm -hmm. the customer. This is what I just heard from engineering, you know? Okay. I hear what you're saying, but design said this other thing and just kind of like helping people see each other's perspectives and not being too hard headed. And I've just, and it's a bit of a Jedi, Jedi mind trick of just like, you know, these are not the droids you're looking for, but, um, everybody ends up just doing what what the PM wanted to do anyways, and they didnn't know. Uh, so I think there is a huge amount of intelligence, yes. <laughs> emotional intelligence required. Stop yeah. telling our secrets, Pat. <laughs> yeah. Super, super quick uh, administrative note. So uh, we still have 20 minutes of discussion uh, left here. So feel free to continue hanging out. But uh, if you're looking for the keynote from Cosima Lafranc, that is now happening in another session. So. Uh, if you want to see that from the beginning, uh, you can head on over now, or you can just stay here and uh, we can chat a little more. Sorry for the interruption. Like when we said about humility, uh, that was uh, that was something that 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 really resonates with me. That you're like you can you can admit that that you will make mistakes. So you're you're in a position where. You're, nothing's perfect there. Um, and yeah, sorry, but something I really liked about this. And also that you don't, you don't know, like, I think it's great to go into that role and just be like, I don't know. I don't, this know. is what I'm hearing from this person. That's what I'm hearing from this person. 
mm. um, rather than I think or do this because we need to, you know. I think you tried to say something a few times, but uh, I can't. Oh. Sure. Sorry. So, um, Janine, you asked about uh, the role of a product owner. We have nobody's really addressed that yet. And in, in my experience, a product owner is more helpful when the organization is structured in such a way that there's someone kind of on the hook for the product who's not the product manager, um, mm -hmm. or they have some sort of specific expertise, or there's multiple products that are sort of part of a bundle or a package of services, or the product manager is owns like one piece of a much larger product and there's several teams working on part of that. So there's like a product owner sort of almost above them in that case, whereas, you know, that role is kind of needs to have a larger visibility and it's worth sort of pulling it out versus rather than just having it inside of, you know, the, the product manager when it's, you know, like a single product team um, with nobody who, who really, nobody else who's on the hook, essentially it's the product manager who's in charge of the success or failure of that. And they have everything they need to make strategic decisions and the trust of the leadership um, mm -hmm. uh, to do that. There's there's one other aspect to this of in terms of like splitting up roles, which is something we see in what we help companies do in terms of doing tra innovation transformation uh, inside of large companies. And the same thing is true when you try to reorganize a product team from say a traditional, you know, there's there's, there's a product manager who does X, Y, and Z, and there's, you know, a very kind of like traditional structure. Um, and there's kind of like three aspects that need to be taken care of. One is like the leadership, right? So the leadership has to agree and say, Hey, we're willing to try a different structure than is maybe, you know, well proven, you know, somewhere else we want to take, you know, a star developers time and have them spend it sitting in customer uh, interviews, because we think that's going to be a better use of their time than them just doing more code, right? Like that's kind of a leadership decision in terms of how they want to, um, you know, do their, spend their resources. And, you know, the PM may advocate for that, or they may advocate against it. That's, that's a leadership mm -hmm. decision about how you're spending resources. The second is, you know, culturally, the way you organize needs to be very different when everybody's doing a little bit of everything versus when one person is doing a lot of, you know, a sort of specific task, right? So all of the, the meeting cadence really needs to change. The types of like the agendas of those meetings change, the feeling of, you know, who's responsible for what needs to change. It's a very different feeling in terms of the culture of that type of team. And then the third thing is the skill set. you know, running a customer interview is not something everyone knows how to do. You need to develop those skills um, for all of those different tasks that Matthias, you know, showed in his sort of um, collection of product manager tasks, you need to develop those skills inside of each individual. So there's kind of like a leadership buy-in, there's a cultural component that needs to change, and then the skill set, um, if you're thinking of going from one to the other, uh, either way that it is. Yeah, that was helpful, thank you. Like it's strategize we are, um... We're trying to to get like everyone in front of customers. We're a small team, and um, mm -hmm. we're attending like, for example, next uh, Wednesday I will be attending a a call with a customer where we go over uh, like jobs, pains, and gains of that customer. And um, so I'm a software developer here, and uh, all the other software developers are in the same position. They can talk to the customer. There's no like you can't talk to the customer. And that's also important for us. So if we want to, if we feel that we need to talk to the customer because we want to solve that problem, we just do it. We don't need to go like, hey, product manager, please do that for us. So that like that uh, absence of this restriction or this constraint, um, I think makes us faster and makes us as product team members much better, much better informed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I, I think like um, some of some of my the development team I work with, they want nothing to do with the customer. That's just not their forte, and that's that's totally okay. Um, but if a, if if some of the team comes and says, "Hey, I'd like to hear from the customer to understand this better," you know, I'd, I'd welcome that. I would you know definitely uh, encourage that engagement because the better they understand the problem, maybe they see something I missed. You know, I, I'm going to look 
to, to not be, again, that person that says, I know it all, you're not talking to the customer. Um, I, I think it, it could be valuable uh, if that's something that the, that the team needs and, and wants. And again, like Alan said, it does depend on the organization structure. Um, but I, I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't mind it. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. Also, that would make my job a bit easier if I do not have to pitch it also to the developers. And sometimes it's a bit tricky because they just take uh, um, the input I give them, but do not really understand the customer needs. And also takes a lot of time to really get them understand it. And if they would talk to the customers themselves sometimes, um, that really would have a lot. So I think that's pretty good to have everybody involved and get everybody each word to call, to call um, talk to a customer each um, at least um, sometimes. So I think that would really help you get the whole picture because we are building a product for the customer. So it would be really good for everybody to hear what a customer needs. So I totally agree with that. Yeah. On the uh, on the topic of uh, of talking to customers, it's. Uh, also interesting for me to hear because so I'm coming from the design side uh, originally, and uh, most places I worked at, what I found was that if if customer interviews research is uh, happening at all, it's mostly come either from the design side or from some sort of a research department, and very often from PMs, but also from engineers and so forth. The uh, the the stance was very often we'd love to do this we'd love to talk to more customers but either we don't know how or we don't have the time or we don't have the time to figure out how yeah. um and in that regard i found it super interesting also uh on on the chat uh mihai has uh, has said something i don't know if uh, they're still here uh said i think the pms mirror of oh there there they are i don't have to read the the comment if uh you can say it directly. Hey, cool. Um, <laughs> I'm a designer at core. Actually, I started as a visual designer and then I did whatever was necessary, basically, in my cross-functional team. So I did interaction design and I ended up also doing product, uh, writing acceptance criteria and studying some business cases and looking over analytics and so on and so forth. So at some point, I don't know what I am anymore. Let's say I'm a product designer because it has the word product and it has all these aspects in it. Mm -hmm. And I haven't done visual design in seven years or so. Um, so that's what I noticed, at least, is that uh, product managers tend to be a bit of a like all purpose uh, general firefighters. They will do whatever is needed to get the job done. And whatever is missing, they will try to fill it in, whatever missing position or skill in the team. Yeah, yeah I think you also had a good point about um, just uh, the dysfunctions of an org and that you can see those sort of writ large in, a, in what a PM is doing. Like if they're you're missing design, you, they start doing wireframes. If you're missing data, maybe they start pulling data. And I think kind of implicit in that is like, if your PM is doing that for too long, you probably need to hire somebody to do that thing that you're probably missing some piece of your team. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really like insightful is to look for the dysfunctions um, that are happening and then think like, you know, is this activity worth enough to have somebody focused on it? Because that's the, I think that's the danger of general generalists is like you can say yeah everybody should listen to the customer and then everybody should also be you know um, thinking about the marketing and then you know involved in the design process but then like at the end of the day there's other work that needs to be done who's doing that and so mm -hmm. there is a kind of science or maybe an art to like dividing roles and just saying this is important enough to have somebody every day thinking about this. Yeah, it's 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 right, it's on, right on. I mean, when we're missing, uh, when we're missing team members, people leave or 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 whatnot. Uh, I notice it first because you know it always comes back to hey, if I if I'm missing my QA guy, hey Ben, uh, can you help test this? You know, and that uh, of course, it, as as you know, it, it's it's like absolutely whatever needs to be done you, you people are always going to come to me and i'm i'm usually going to say yes but you're mm -hmm. right if it if it happens you know uh a month goes by and you're still doing that that's a problem because you're going to start losing value where where i could be uh more useful so it does it does help an organization identify where a need might be 
How would you feel, feel about the metaphor of um, orchestra conductor, right? Um, director. Oh. Um, so if you have all the instruments at place with great musicians and a hundred something people, right? That everyone knows what to do. Everyone has their job. Everyone understands what it is about. Then it's a quite an elegant job, right? You, uh, you actually communicate to the public as a conductor, right? You bow you get your applause, everyone is performing on, in an ensemble. Well, the reality, the practical reality is that you're missing half of the people on the stage and you run from the violin to actually play something on the piano and then hit the drum, then <laughs> forgot to wave actually your baguette. So pretty much that's the, probably the theory versus practice aspect of it. <laughs> I think there's one one thing with the analogy that's really like the the most broken part of it is who's writing the music right like this what are we playing here <laughs> where's where's this thing going to end up um th for me that's just the thing that jumps out as far as you know that that not working that the pm really is is not just you know the conductor but also the composer um mm -hmm. and playing some of the in instruments like you said Bennett, you're the new joiner here on stage. Yeah, I, I left because you. I didn't want to because my thought is like in different directions. So that's, I didn't want to want to break all your thoughts. And then I joined the keynote, but there's nothing so far, nothing new for me. So I came back. Uh, <laughs> um, I had this thought on um, because I don't know if, if it was mentioned in this conversation. I think not so far. Um, I agree mostly with the point that Ellen made, like like a couple of the euro above me. I don't know if you have, uh, if I'm, if you're above me for you too, or if you're down below. I don't know. Um, that that it comes back to character. Um, that that the the point of do we need a PM or not? My my, uh, I'm I'm a PM. I'm a PO. I'm a I'm a what what not. Um, I I always say that this, that's like the best team functions without me. Um, I expect everybody to learn at least a title of this kind of stuff that it is normally expected and that Janine pointed out of what, what she did or didn't do. Mm -hmm. And it comes all back to creative theory. And in, in creative theory, in, in what I learned, is from a sociological perspective. So in sociology, you you have different kinds of views on, on how sociology works or, or how societies work. And what sticks mostly with creativity is a system theory. And when it comes especially to, to software, which we mostly all do, I think mo most of us do some, some work in the software area, we have always complex problem systems. They may be just in Germany, they may be worldwide, they may be just in a particular branch. Complex because software never is easy. It used to be at some point, but unfortunately it never is anymore. Um, so what we need to establish is when we have a complex problem system, we need a complex solution system. And the only way we're going to get that system built up is we put it in a team. And then you have the different characters. So what kind of characters do you need to build this complex system that can function and can solve the complex problem that you have? Um, and yeah, that's my thought. I don't know if you disagree or not. I don't know if, you, if it's like, completely off rails now the, the whole discussion because I left <laughs> and also I have really trouble reading the chat and following you guys and I, I really need to work on that yeah I think I mean I think the point of complexity is is really interesting I guess just on a kind of more societal level it is fascinating how little we understand about how everything works and I think we have more and more specific jobs but more and more diverse pursuits. Like, you know, I can get like a single roast coffee from Ethiopia or I can go rock climbing. But then my job is like, you know, I am a UI developer like for this button, you know? And so that's an interesting thing to think about. And then I think also just like complexity writ large in a pencil, like no person involved in the production of a pencil actually knows how to make a pencil. Like, isn't that fascinating? Um, like a wood comes from somewhere, the you know, ink, lead comes from somewhere else and it's cut somewhere else, it's painted somewhere else, delivered somewhere else. But I, I do, I would hesitate 
in reaction to that to create a company that knows how to make a full pencil? Like, I think that's the wrong answer, right? I think the right answer is probably like embrace complexity, figure out where your inputs are, like whether you're like the person who turns wood into like the little line, shaved down line of wood, um, and then just do that really well. Uh, so I, I, I kind of feel like you need to embrace the complexity and like really the role of the product team is to figure out what is the very simple thing that you're making. Um, and if it feels too complex, then maybe you need to scope down. But we're, we're in abstract land, which is where I like to be, but I don't know that um, it's hugely accurate. Well, of course, you, you're, you're totally right that you, you boil it down at some point. Um, otherwise, you can't get something to deliver. However, you need some some sort of some spin around the the whole complex thing. I mean, I work at the company where we where we we do software for 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 local media publishers. So we have these 60 publishers around the, the 60 news portals, always with completely different tones from 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 more or less conservative right wing to, to complete leftist readers. Um, they all use the software to just deliver their content and have their readers interact with each other and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and of course, I can just figure out, okay, I, I'm going to do, I don't know, some, some sort of little tiny part that, that it just adds additional functionality to everyone or just for a little part of the conservative spectrum or on the more or less of the younger spectrum or whatever, how I make my target groups or personas or in whatever you want to dabble in. Um, but at some point, you need to get your head around the, the whole thing. So, so what is from from all perspectives, from the infrastructure that it runs on, from the technology that it uses, from the the design that it it it, it uses around, and that that can't be done by just one person. Um, and you can't boil yeah. it down so it can be theoretically be done by one person. So you need to split it up in some sort of of, of way to go chunks but that's just my opinion in, in the terms of how do i try to to build teams i always try to 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 not build teams around skills and attitude but around the kind of fact if i think these people are they, they're gonna work together i mean i mean i'm not pushing in, in there i just try to mm -hmm. you know this is the kind of thing that i want to build so if, if you're interested you know join me or join the team um and and you, of course, that's back to constraints because normally in, I had the opportunity once so far to build a team. Just you know, if you if you're if you're into it, just you know, let's do it. <laughs> mostly, you don't have people who are just there. Mo mostly, people are there because they're getting paid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, are you saying that if given the, the opportunity to basically you're given a product and you're given some problems to solve for the company, right? For the users, you could actually, do you think uh, it's part of the product manager's role to select basically the best team that could uh, solve that problem? No, it's, it's self-selecting teams. As a product owner, I think uh, Alan left, I don't know if you, who said the point from the influencers, forgot. Um, that, that's more like the point. If you if you do self-selecting teams and you have the opportunity that you have just a bunch of people who, who, who are bored <laughs> to do anything and you pitch them the idea and you 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 say, okay, this is the kind of more or less vision. This is the this thing that we want to build. This is problem this that, is I want problem solve. that I want to solve. That's the, 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 that's, the, the that, that's my vision aim of the product. Um, do you agree with that? Do you want to participate in that? Then, then you get the kind of people. Of course, sometimes you you get three engineers because it's a very technical thing, and you don't get a designer because he, he can't get his head around at some point because mm -hmm. it's too less to information. And then you, of course, you need to kind of scout the the last abilities that you need for for to get. But but to get the first chunk onto the team is just more or less they're going to work great together because they, they see value in that kind of thing. They want to be there. Yeah, I, I, I guess I kind of struggle with that self-selected teams, you know, partly, I think we're talking about these, these roles and we're not talking about scales. So like there's junior designers and there's like super senior designers, right? And there's like a growth path for them and they need to work on certain types of projects. Same for Eng, same for PM. And like thinking about how people are going to grow, like they're not like template PMs. You can't just like assemble them. 
Uh, and then the, the size of the company matters a ton. Like I have a researcher that I work with. If I was at a startup, I would be doing the research. And so like, you know, are you a 10,000 person company or are you at a 10 person company? I, I think that that changes a lot. Um, but yeah, definitely agree that people should be excited to be there. Uh, it's always a surprise to me how excited people can be about things that they just learned about. So I, I think generally people get excited to work with other other folks. And, and again, motivation is a huge piece of the product story. I agree. I mean, it's just one part. There's, there's, like I said, it's too complex to do all this kind of thing. I totally agree with the junior and senior thing. Both can go wrong in so many ways. You have seniors who don't look over their kind of, you know, constraints, whatever. Um, you have uh, juniors who, who never seen anything else for, for that kind of part. And myself, I, I, I mean, look at our age cluster here. Um, we haven't, we have, we, we can't have seen as much of Jeff. So, you know, is he, is he a guru? I don't know. So it's too complex to just say, okay, this is just one I I just wanted to put it in here from the complex creative systems. One way to approach it might not always be the best way. It might not always be on one way, but it's, it gets my, it helps me a lot to think in problem systems and that I need to build systems to solve that problem. I think also related to the organization. Oh, okay. I was just going to ask Alan if he can say the things that he's putting in the chat uh, here as well, but he has to run. Thank you so much, Alan. Yeah, you could read it. I'm not going to say anything. Because <laughs> well, well, well. there was the See, question of having, having uh, product managers yeah. at Strategizer. And um, the answer was no. Um, and the cool thing is, like, um, it, it came to, like, people left, people came, we restructured, we... Uh, we dive more, really a lot more into culture, like how to create a, a great culture. Yeah. Um, we even have a, a, a dedicated person to do culture, 100% um, of his work time. And um, so we started to say, okay, we don't have that pro product manager left. Where, where do we distribute the, the different things that need to be done? So people started, like developers started talking to customers. Uh, developers started to create wireframes. Um, it was like, put a developer who's never done that before on a customer interview, just sitting there taking notes, no camera on whatsoever. After that call, you will get a, an amazing uh, feedback from the developer. who will tell you, oh, that's amazing. I, now I, I, I get that. Uh, I understand it so much more. And you will, people will start grow, growing there. They want to, they will get the desire sometimes to, to go more into that uh, customer on this customer side. And um, this is what we experienced over the last three and a half years, I would say, um, that the more you make it open, the system open, the more people jump into the voids that, that are left there and uh, they're unfilled. So you're like, I'm part of this team. I'll go in there because no one else is doing it. Um, that's the generalist. But still, I, I agree with Pat, like, Sometimes you need the specialist uh, in in, uh, yeah. in in these special cases. How do we, how how do you make people talk to customers? I mean, I try. <laughs> I I I try to force people at some point. I try to convince them. I try to to give them tools to get you know user work for. There's this one cool tool I've forgotten how it works. Test user user testing user whatever doesn't matter. Um, how, how how do you do that it's just it's just so hard to to get other people i mean i realized it and once they realize that they are fans of that too but then also it kind of derails again so you know you gotta have you talking to your customers in the last three months well no actually not we were busy doing whatever that's that's kind of pain for me so much to to get other people talking to customers would, would you say those people who don't want to customers actually love the product they're working on because I, I experienced this, like working with a team that really loves their product and they're really way more op open to um, watching interviews, seeing, jumping in, you know, stepping outside of their, let's say, development bubble or so. But I also seen teams that worked 
two months on this project and then a month there and a month there and they are completely out of love and passion with anything because they they just didn't have time to settle in and learn the the, the product well and so on they were just given a to-do list so i found that the, the level of engagement and passion around that is different depending on it, if they actually love the product or not yeah i think the con also most of them if you if you um... There's, there's two things. If you if you are if if people paying for your product, mostly like B two B kind of stuff, and if your people are just using your product because it's in a, either free to use or something, mm -hmm. um, if you jump on a, in, in the B two B area, people are afraid. Are they, the, the 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 experience that I mean, people are afraid to talk to customers because they know their flaws. No no software is perfect. You can't satisfy everybody, and some people are, or some parts, or maybe even your entire software sucks at some point because, I don't know, you have had performance issues for the last months or something. And then you're afraid to jump on that call because you know he's going to make that a point in that conversation. Um, and he's paying for it, so he's pissed. <laughs> so I think that's one point. Um, it doesn't have to do with like if you love your product or if you're engaged with your product, you can still be, but you're just you know you they're, they're afraid. And the other part is you're kind of overwhelmed in how to reach your the kind of persons, the kind of guys you want to have. Because if you have a free to use product, who are you gonna pick? Where do I even start to find a customer to talk to? I mean, I have methods for that, but. I have trouble convincing people to do that. Um, I can just speak from what we did. Like we had a lot of introverts on the team um, that you might think like they don't want to jump on, on customer calls, for example. Um, so what we did is basically being the Sherpa. So he had someone who was experienced in that. He took you with him and into that call once, twice or more. Um, and you had to... You, after that, like people were convinced of, of doing that. They were really, really like they were our, the developers were asking for where is the evidence for that? Like they wanted to see these results of these experiments um, before that was not the case. I was not asking for that before. Now I'm do, I do that. Um, and if you like one one way to do that would be you, you create a customer pool that you talk to regularly by just as, as an example. And people can, you set up a, a like a, a fixed spot once a week, twice, uh, or once a month, where these kind of people can just go in and say, okay, I'll do that interview. Just sign up for one, get matched with a customer, and you interview. Um, so this is what you can do. Uh, there are maybe so many ways of engaging people. This is also a leadership thing. So it's you want to help people grow, no matter if you're like a, a manager or a team member, if you embrace leadership, you um, help people into that. 